Good morning, everyone. My name is Tobias Matei. I'm the deputy editor of the North American Spine Society Journal. And today I have the pleasure of having with me today, Dr. Marco Burkhardt. Um, he's from the Department of Orthopedic Surgery from the University of Zurich in Switzerland. Switzerland. And he is the uh, uh, first author of an article recently published in the NASJ entitled Clinical Relevance of, Co of Occult Infections in Spinal Surreatrosis Revision. Thank you very much for your time today. And would you like uh, maybe uh, start introducing yourself, maybe a little bit of your practice and your research interest? Yeah, all right. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, the invitation. It's it's an honor being here and uh, having the interview with you. And yeah, so as you said, I am uh, working in Zurich and uh, University Hospital of Balgrist, which is uh, uh, the University Department for Orthopedics in Zurich. And I'm a six-year uh, surgical resident, so um, I'm still in training. And actually, at the moment, I'm not working in Zurich. I'm in Kur, uh, which is like in the Swiss Alps, where I do my trauma rotation. So that's, uh, that's about me. So uh, tell us, uh, why did you get interested in this, this topic? And how did you try to achieve uh, the goals um, of, of your of kind of unveiling a little bit of the pattern of the long-term outcomes in patients with occult spinal infections? Yeah, so um, I've, I've been doing research uh, basically in spine surgery since graduation. And um, uh, I'm working very closely with the head of uh, department uh, at Balgrist, Massa Farshad. And um, yeah, like when, uh, when I started my residency there, I, I, I started on that topic occult infections because we've seen kind of uh, a lot of spinal pseudarthrosis patients and uh, we've seen some of them uh, having an infection even though no one suspected that there is an inf infection and um, yeah so that's that's where uh, I and uh, me myself and, uh, and uh, my my mentor Master Farshad we thought we have to look at this uh, closer and see how many of these uh, pseudosrosis revisions are actually infected, uh, despite there is no suspicion of infection. So first of all, we we uh, we did a retrospective um, analysis of all patients uh, that were that had a pseudosrosis revision between 2014 and 2019, and uh, there's been a, around 150 patients. Uh, that underwent pseudarthrosis revision on the spine. And uh, we found that 10% of these uh, patients were infected um, with uh, low-grade infections, uh, most, most of them with uh, Cutibacterium acnes. And yeah, this, that was like the first part of it. So how, how many are actually infected even if there's no suspicion of infection? And then after that, um, I thought, okay, what does it mean for a patient or, or for the treating doctor? What does it mean for them? If, if you find this uh, occult infection, does it mean a worse outcome? I mean, obviously it means uh, antibiotic treatment and maybe also some side effects, but what does it mean in terms of re-revision rates and, uh, and uh, patient reported outcome measures? And so that's, that's a that's a topic on on the study we, study we are discussing today. Perfect. So tell our listeners a little bit about the results you found, and in terms of the long term outcomes and how these two cohorts compare. Namely, those patients that are going through arthrosis revision surgery, which were found to have infection, and the match control group that had no infection. Yeah. So actually, our uh, hypothesis was that. Um, patients with an infection would have actually a worse outcome than those who have not. I mean, that's like the, the basic instinct we have, right? Um, and uh, so we looked at it uh, in our cohort, uh, which had like a long-term outcome. I mean, it's like a mid to long-term outcome. There's been like one year to five years and actually, 
the outcomes of patients with occult infection was very comparable than to the others. Actually, there was there was even a, a lower rate of re, re uh, revision surgery in the in the group with occult infection, which is like uh, kind of like uh, uh, counterintuitive, right? Mm -hmm. and, and and one of the things that just highlighting to our readers the challenge of of trying to establish statistical significance in the setting is the very low sample that we're dealing with. So most of the studies dealing with occult infection and pseudoartrosis, you're gonna find in the range of a few dozen patients. And um, ultimately, as in your case, you didn't find a statistical significance, which is, it, it's a very interesting result, at least, I mean, it was counterintuitive, as you said, to your initial hypothesis. And I think that's at least partially explained by the fact that these are very indolent infections, right? They're not MRSA infections, they are known to be uh, uh, C. acne's infection, and we know there's a lot of interesting in the literature about the even the role that possibly some ongoing latent C. acne's infections may have in terms of modic changes. Uh, we see articles, uh, several uh, studies on that. Uh, but one of the things that I would like to ask you in terms of the diagnosis of infection, I was surprised that you were able to find up to 10% of those patients undergoing revision surgery for pseudoartrosis with positive cultures. And I'm telling that because we're just in the last, in the NAS meeting in Chicago a few weeks ago, and I saw a very interesting presentation uh, from a group from Birmingham, Alabama, and they were comparing the sensitivity, positive predictive value, uh, and specificity of uh, standard cultures with other methods of diagnosis infection. Uh, I think in that study, they use next generation sequencing and what is called isothermal microcolorimetry. And it was interesting in that case, I think from the 22 cases of patients undergoing revision for pseudoartrosis, they had zero patients that the cultures were positive, but the next generation sequencing was positive in uh, detected the presence of a bacteria in 9% in of the cases. Um, actually, 18% of the cases and the, the isothermal uh, microcalorimetry in 9% of the cases. So that just tells me that perhaps we're really underestimating the, the, the prevalence of infection in these cases. And then maybe the case because we're trying to culture this ve very low virulence bacteria, and maybe our culture methods are still leaving us behind. So I just want to hear your insights, whether you think that maybe even the 10% you found was probably an underestimation related to the way we're diagnosing infection in this population. Um, yeah, so this is actually a very interesting uh, topic. I mean, where where's the cutoff? Where do you put the cutoff also between contamination and infection? And... Um, there's no general rule, and obviously there's some newer uh, laboratory methods to detect any infection. Um, we in Zurich we we defined an infection as if at least two out of a minimum of uh, three uh, specimen were positive with the same pathogen, then it's it, it is defined as a, an infection or and it's incubated for 14 days um, and that's that's uh, the definition of an infection that that we have and uh, the other method that we use is sonication so we send in the screws or or whatever material you take out uh, uh, send it to sonication and if there's uh, more than 50 colonies per milliliter in this sonication fluid found, then it's also uh, then it's also defined as an infection. So tell me about two two uh, things related to the methodology of your study. I mean, first, where did you obtain the cultures? Was it always from the whole of the pedicle screw? Because I think, I mean, at least in my mind, that would be the most sensitive place to have a positive culture, or like you mentioned, from the screw. Um, and the second one, what was the treat the standard treatment for those patients that you found have a positive C. acnes? Was it just uh, or antibiotics for two weeks, or what was the protocol that, that you've been employing for that? So uh, first, uh, this, um, samples were 
mainly taken from, yeah, as you said, from the, the pedicle area and also from the posterolateral pseudosterosis area. At least two of the samples were taken from that area. And then at least one sample also from the lamina at that level too. And uh, yeah, in some cases also the, we've taken some more uh, specimen, but these were, these were um, like the main areas that the specimen were taken. But, you know, it was a retrospective ana analysis going back to 2014 and actually our, our treatment or let's say our diagnostic protocol was not completely standardized. So, because we didn't know how, how many or is it, is it relevant at all? And, um, and, uh, and now we know, so um, now it's more standardized and we do it for every patient who's undergoing pseudosterosis revision and at least these three samples. So two at the pedicle screw uh, uh, insertion sites and one at the lamina. And the second point, um, standard treatment for C. acnes patients. Um, these were like all the, all the C. acnes patients we had in the cohort um, were treated with clindamycin, but treatment was not only for two weeks, it was actually for three months. Okay. Which is also yeah, duration of antibiotic treatment is another very interesting topic. Um, there's there's also studies also from from our clinic that indicate that uh, antibiotic treatment there's no difference between antibiotic treatment for six weeks or for three months. So yeah, but it's another topic, but still very interesting. Yeah. Correct. And I don't think there's any standard protocol for that. I often get questions about infectious disease to try to classify any postoperative infection that's superficial or deep. And then they say, if it's a deep infection, we're going to do six weeks of IV antibiotics. Some attendees, they like to keep what they call immunosuppression, which is just chronic or antibiotics for a little bit longer. But I do agree that the evidence regarding the length of treatment of antibiotics, um, it's, it's still very poor. And one thing that you mentioned that uh, it was, you mentioned that the finding that the outcomes were um, similar between the two groups was a little bit counterintuitive because you thought that maybe perhaps those patients with infections might have a poor outcome. And when I first read this paper, that makes sense to me because I, I can see basically in my practice two groups of patients with pseudoarthrosis. There's one group that you know that the pseudoarthrosis is, if not directly related, at least substantially related to some mechanical factors. So it's the type of patients that had a T10 to pelvis with suboptimal correction of um, their sagittal balance or a, a patient with a long instrumentations and severe osteoporosis or a patient with PJK. So you know those patients, probably the main factor related to the pseudoarthrosis is the biomechanics uh, between your hardware and the bone interface. And, and there are those other patients that they are young, they seem to have good bone quality. Um, you've used um, autologous uh, 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 bone for posterior lateral as well as interbody fusion. And even with that, those patients still didn't fuse. And I, I think that's a subgroup of patients that when you have no other reason or at least biomechanical reason for the pseudoarthrosis, those are the patients that um, we should be more suspicious uh, of infection. And, and I agree with you, there's no reason for not collecting samples in every single patient that you submit to surgery for pseudoarthrosis. But I, I think you mentioned in the discussion, I mean, if that was the main reason for the pseudoarthrosis and you treat the patient surgically and re-instrumented or uh, inserted more allograph, uh, did whatever revision surgery you did. And on top of that, you treated infection. I have no reason to suspect that those patients will have perhaps even a better outcome than those patients for whom the reason of the pseudoarthrosis was biomechanical in nature, right? Yes, yeah, so very well summarized. Um, yeah, um, I mean, what do you think when you have a patient that has an postoperative infection or uh, infectious revision surgery, you always think of bad outcomes, but you also, you also don't expect like the best outcomes in any pseudoarthrosis revision uh, surgery anyway. You know, these are patients 
they will still complain, they will still have some pain, but you hope to, to make it better for them, right? Um, and yeah, as, as you uh, said very well, that in this subgroup of these of patients undergoing pseudosthrosis revision, we actually find a cause for the for the pseudosthrosis. I mean, pseudosthrosis is, I think, multifactorial. So maybe BMI, maybe poor bone quality, um, maybe smoking, I don't know, or there's several other factors that a patient could have to develop a pseudosthrosis. Um, and some of these factors or most of these factors you cannot really treat. Uh, but if, if the, the really causative um, factor is an infection, you have actually have a treatment option, which is antibiotics, besides surgery, of course. And as we discussed, these are usually indolent infections like C. acnes. So even in patients that we had post-operative infections and had to reoperate uh, and the identified bacteria was MRSA or um, E. coli. I mean, you treat those patients with IV antibiotics uh, and I'm not seeing a higher revision rate for those patients, either because recurrence of the infection or because of pseudoarthrosis. So even for standard post-operative infections with more aggressive bacteria, once the, the treatment is finished and you did whatever protocol your infectious disease recommended, I've not seen that the long-term outcomes in those patients would be worse because of the perioperative infection. So um, as you mentioned, I, I do think it makes sense um, to imagine that to take at face value the results you found, of course, with the caveat of the low sample population, but it's a very well done study and it highlights that if anything, it seems we have reasonable evidence to, to believe that those patients with identified low virulence infection in the revision surgery and properly treated, they have at least comparable outcomes with the, the group of pseudoarthrosis and no infection. So I think that's a very interesting uh, result and a significant contribution uh, to the literature. So for me, summarizing the, the takeaways of this study is, is that I, I think as a spine surgery community, we sometimes underestimate um, the, the role that this um, indolent infections may have, especially in the setting of pseudoarthrosis. So uh, taking into account the very low burden of just collecting some co collecting intraoperative cultures during the surgery. I believe that is a very um, reasonable protocol for every spine surgeon to at least consider collecting, consider uh, establishing as a standard practice to, to collect cultures uh, at any revision surgery for pseudoarthrosis. And then if those are positive, of course, properly treating the patients. And, and of course, I mean, further research in this topic, um, even if it's retrospective, uh, like in your case, uh, may further enlighten the not only the the sensitivity of the methods you were using for identifying the infection. What is the gold standard for detecting infections? Because as you mentioned, um, in some studies, this one I mentioned the abstract we saw at the meeting. The gold standard was the, was the pseudoarthrosis itself. So that's a little bit problematic because then you're assuming every pseudoarthrosis is associated with infection. But the fact is that this patients with pseudoarthrosis and, and occult infections, they don't have elevations in white blood count. They don't have elevations in CRP, uh, ESR, or any other inflammatory markers. So uh, I think we're, we're comparing methods of diagnosis infections, but we still don't have a gold standard for that. And any other takeaways from the study or anything you would like our readers to, to have in mind uh, going forward? And of course, I always encourage them to go go back and, and read your 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 article uh, and have a, a critical overview, not only of your methods, but about the relevance of, of your conclusions. But uh, I'll leave some, some time for you now to just highlight what, what else you would like about your research. Yeah. Um, obviously, obviously, to everyone that is watching this interview, if you if you're treating a spinal pseudoarthrosis patient, if you see one in your practice, and also if you decide to to re uh, to undergo revision surgery for this patient, 
think of these occult infections. Just it, it may be 10% uh, or around 10%. And taking uh, biopsies, taking specimen, it's not, it's not that uh, extra, not, not that much extra work to do it. And look, look for it. And if you find it, of course, uh, do the antibiotic treatment. And also, I would uh, like to encourage uh, others to to invest on that topic. We don't know we don't know how important antibiotic treatment is for these patients and how long these antibiotic treatments should be. And um, these is these are just the first studies giving a little insight on the topic, but obviously there's more research needed to, to really establish um, protocols that help patients in the end. Perfect. Dr. Barkhardt, again, congratulations on your hard work uh, that led to the, this publication, and we appreciate your time today and success in your spine surgery practice. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.